Number eight of ten streaming live sessions on the book of Revelation. Wow, what have we done? It's supposed to be an overview. Uh, don't want you to lose the big picture. What's the big picture? Jesus showing up in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. It's a, it's a visionary picture. It's symbolic. Uh, lampstands are churches. Seven lampstands equals the whole church. And Jesus is the light of his church. He's the light of this world. And he comes and he shines and it's revealed that he's on the throne. Who's on the throne? Jesus, Jesus is on the throne. The Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. That's what we looked at in chapter 4, chapter 5. The new covenant is now in effect. And because the new covenant is in effect, the seven seals on the scroll are being opened. And so then we looked at another whole series of seven, seven letters to the churches, seven seals of the new covenant, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And we saw that there was a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of destruction that was happening in these. And uh, I said, well, it's very important for us to see that it isn't, as, it isn't in the future towards some speculative second coming that these are directed, but that the book, the scope of the book, the timing of the book of Revelation is in this generation from when Jesus actually came the first time and he instituted the new covenant. He opened the new covenant. That's what this is a picture of. The new covenant is now open. The seals are broken and the horses, which are the strength, the strengths are being released and, and we looked at the, the horses that are the first four of the seals and we saw that really this is uh, an evidence that God truly has been faithful to his word. And when he said he, he was going to bring a new covenant into being, he did it. And he did it at the cross. He did it at the first coming. It's not just the kingdom isn't going to just come at the second coming. He's already here. Pilate wrote above him, this is the king of the Jews. Not this will be the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. And when Jesus came as the king of the Jews and established the kingdom here, then he said, let your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a change in perspective here. We've got to have our sunglasses on, right, Carl? Yeah. S-O-N glasses. We've got to see Jesus in this. Now, the covenant that he brought into effect was he came, and as many as received him, they received mercy. Have you received the mercy of God, forgiveness of sins? Amen? Amen. Well, there's more to it than that. It's not just my sins are forgiven, i got a ticket to heaven. No, I've received a whole new life. I've received the, the grace of God in my life. As many as received him, he gave the power to be sons of God. In other words, in this covenant, we have the opportunity to walk in his mercy and walk in his grace. But if you don't, then the other side is he came unto his own, but his own didn't receive him. They rejected him. And because he came to his own and the Jewish leaders rejected him, when, they, when Pilate actually offered them, which one should I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus? They said, Barabbas, well, what should I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him? Crucify your king? He says, we got no king but Jesus. Well, what about, what about Jesus? Well, let his blood be on us. That's in the scripture. So if you don't receive the mercy of God through the blood, then the judgment is going to come. Then the fire of the blood, the blood turns, the red turns from that which uh, truly cleanses, the life is in the blood, turns into judgment. And that's what was happening here. In one generation, Jesus said, all these things are going to pass. They're going to come to pass. Uh, he looked at the temple and everybody's saying, this is so great. And yet God's saying, Jesus said, not one stone is going to be left on top of one another here. Uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse. The book of Revelation, the only, God, John's is the only gospel that doesn't have an Olivet Discourse. I believe the book of Revelation is that Olivet Discourse. He is actually prophesying. And right to the very year, he prophesied the judgment of Jerusalem, destruction of the city and of the temple. Forty years later, 70 AD, it's documented. It's not in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible, most of the Bible was written. The book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's prophesying the vision of it, 
but the actual history of it bears witness to the truth of the Word of God. Can you see it? Can you see it? How many are under the mercy of God? It's so good, isn't it? You know, we don't have to come under the judgment of God. We're in a new covenant, and we can walk in blessing. But what he's describing here, somebody says, well, what about all the disasters? Well, rather than them all being off in the future, like we looked at the, uh, the seals and the trumpets and the, and the bowls being poured out, all those disasters, well, they came on Jerusalem at 70 AD. The city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The temple was never to be rebuilt again, and it will not be rebuilt again. So if you're looking for that to be a prophetic sign in the earth, you are missing what God is doing. He's moved on. <laughs> so shall we move on? Okay, what I want to look at here tonight is seven visions, seven interludes in between these seven seals, trumpets, and bowls. In the midst of these, see, these are visions. They're not, des they're not describing events that just take place. He's wanting to give us the whole overall picture that if you're in covenant relationship, you can walk in blessing. If you're not in covenant relationship, as Jerusalem was that had crucified the Lord and turned its back on God, then you come under the judgments. But in the middle of the judgments, he wants to get our attention so clear and refocus us on the blessings of the covenant. Okay? So, chapter 6, we read about the seals being opened. The seals that begin to release the judgments that are going into the earth. The first horse is the white horse. That's the gospel going forth. And then the red and the black and the sickly green horse, they all follow. And then the fifth seal being opened, the martyrs that suffer the persecution. They're crying out, how long? And the devastation gets, just gets worse and worse until the last verse of the sixth seal, chapter 6, verse six, 17 says, the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Okay, the rest of what we're going to look tonight is seven visions of answering that question. Who stands? <laughs> After done and all, all is said and done, when the smoke clears, Jesus is standing. <laughs> uh, all through it. And those who stand with God, those who stand with Jesus, they stand in his mercy. We stand in his grace. Okay, so God wants to answer that question. In between the sixth and the seventh seal, right here, chapter seven, after these things, I saw four angels standing. Everybody say standing. standing. <laughs> okay? it's, it's, it's good to be able to stand. Having done all, stand, he says in Ephesians. Now, here, the rest of the world is saying, who can stand? <laughs> well, right away, we see very clearly these angels, these four angels are standing. Okay? This is the first vision I want us to see. Okay, four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. They got all the bases covered. They're holding the four winds, the winds that should blow on the earth, the sea or the tree. And in the midst of all this destruction that is being held back, see, the four angels are holding back the four winds. Uh, wind can be nice if it's a breeze, but when it gets to be 200 miles an hour, <laughs> it blows a lot of things off its base, off its foundation. He says, I saw another angel ascending from the east. He had the seal of the living God. Okay, we're in the middle of the seals being broken, and these are destructive things. And he says, but if you take a look, there's something else going on here. There's an interlude in the symphony, in the opera. I don't want you to focus on the destruction. I want you to see something else happening here. That in the middle of all this, there's another angel coming. He's coming from the east, the sunrise. And he's got the seal of the living God. And he cries with a loud voice to the four angels. He says, don't harm. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Okay, so he says, you cannot release your full impact until, we, until I do something. And that is giving the seal of the living God. Well, yes, the other seals are being broken, but this seal has to be, it has to take effect first. And it's actually going to be implanted in the forehead. Oh, a lot of people right away, that kind of terminology you're thinking of. Well, don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> okay? Mark of the beast. Dum, 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 dum. No, it's seal of the living God, seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. Um, 
Nothing can happen until this takes place. Now, in the forehead, the scripture, scripture interprets scripture, talks about a number of marks or seals in people's forehead. The first son was Cain who slew his brother Abel. And because he did that, God marked him on his forehead. He marked him the mark of Cain. Now, a lot of people, without reading the Bible, they think, oh, that marked him as a murderer. That marked him for just... No, it didn't. It, he marked him. God marked him because if Cain was slain, slain, then the first two brothers both would have been murdered. They would have been killed. And he didn't want that to happen. God is a God of mercy. <laughs> so he actually puts a mark on Cain, and he says, that's so that nobody will touch you. <laughs> Nobody will bring vengeance against you because really you're still my son and I want that shows God's heart that he wants to he wants to extend his mercy he wants us to receive his mercy uh, later on when Moses freed Egypt, uh, Israel from Egypt and he brought him out to Mount Sinai and he says this is how you approach God he said his brother Aaron is the high priest and he had all sorts of garments that he put on him but on his head there was a, a mitre a, Nice, beautiful hat with a gold band around it. And right around it, in the center of his forehead, it said, Holiness to the Lord. That showed that the high priest who would go into the Holy of Holies on behalf of all Israel would be accepted. Holiness. Holiness is really vital to God. And then he said to the rest of the congregation, and, and the Jews actually put this into practice. They would... They would t uh, write out scriptures on little pieces of paper, roll them up in the balls, put them into a little box called a phylactery, and then tie it on their foreheads. Why? Because the forehead, put your hand on your forehead. What's in there? <laughs> well, hopefully there's a head in here that has a mind, <laughs> right? And God says, I want to renew your minds. I want you to take my mind to be your mind, your way of thinking. So that you, he already says, uh, your thoughts are not my thoughts. But he says, I want my thoughts to be your thoughts. So he's saying here, there's something about the seal of the living God that will actually, it's his heart to us. It's his mind to us. Now, he's writing this just before the judgment is going to come against Jerusalem. And he's drawing on all sorts of imagery from the prophets in the Old Testament. Daniel, Zechariah, and one of them is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was about so 600 years beforehand, before this time. And he was writing about the first time that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He was in Babylon. God actually transported him to Jerusalem a thousand miles away. And he saw a vision. And in this vision, there were six men that were released, like six horses <laughs> that were released. Okay, you can read this in Ezekiel chapter 9. And uh, they were released to go and bring judgment to kill whoever. Oh, can't miss this part. Before they could do their part of killing, there was a man who had a pen with ink. And he was to go before them and put a mark on the forehead of everybody whose heart was really right before God. So before the judgment, before the destruction could come, the mercy had to be administered because God looks on the heart. You get the picture? Yeah, you can read this in Ezekiel chapter 9. So the one man went and put a mark. Now, it's very amazing what that mark was. The mark is called Taf, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Anybody know what the mark of God looks like? Taf? No? It's a cross. <laughs> Hundreds, thousands of years before this is happening, Jesus shows up. He's all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. The, the cross was prophesied. Jesus said, I'm the beginning and the ending. I'm the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> okay? So this is, this is going to be the end of all the pain and all the suffering. This is the mark that God is merciful. And before judgment comes, God gives mercy. Amen? You see it? Okay. Pentecost, the seal of the living God, always comes before Holocaust. 
In fact, Scripture interprets Scripture. What is the seal of the living God? Paul says in the book of Ephesians that when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so the blood of Christ comes. You receive Christ, and then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's not some spooky kind of uh, mysterious thing. It's meant to be a revelation. Can you see it? Amen? Okay, so we're back in chapter 7 of Revelation. He says, now I want you to see this seal, the seal of the living God. Uh, I heard the number, verse 4. There's a number of those that were sealed, 144,000. And then in verse 9 it says, uh, and after these things I looked and I saw a great multitude. So John is hearing and seeing. Now you cannot see 144,000. It's pretty hard, you know. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 143,000. No, it's, it's hard to get the detail by seeing. He heard the number and then he saw the great multitude. Now, first of all, what he, what he hears is 144,000. There's a lot of confusion about the 144,000. Some people said, oh, it's a literal number and these are the number that are going to make it to heaven. doesn't say that at all. <laughs> In fact, if you're going to look at it literally, you're going to end up in problems like the Jehovah Witnesses have and do. Okay? What it simply is, it's a spiritual number. 12 times 12. 12 is the number of government. 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. 12 times 12 times 1,000. What's 1,000? 10 cubed. 10 to the third. It's a number of innumerable. Okay, so what we've got here is a number of government innumerable. In other words, God is in control. That's what he wants to show us here. And um, they're all the tribes of Israel. But when you go to the multitude that he sees, verse 9, it's of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Standing. <laughs> it's right there. Standing. Who can stand? The question is. Well, here we see who's standing. The angels are standing. And the people of God, a great multitude, are standing. Now, who are these people? Well, he says they're of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And some people said, well, if it's literal, 144,000, and then there's going to be the 12 tribes of Israel restored. That cannot be. Why? Because these are not the literal tribes of Israel. Uh, one is missing. Anybody know which one is missing? Check your Bible. One is missing. Twelve tribes. Hmm. Well, Levi's included. Both the, the sons of uh, Joseph, well, it says Joseph, and then Manasseh's included. But there's a big glaring air here. Somebody is missing. Anybody know who's missing? Daniel knows who's missing. Yeah. It's Daniel. Why? Because this is a picture of the accepted sons and daughters in the covenant of God. And Daniel is missing because Daniel means judgment. <laughs> there is no judgment in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Isn't that good to know? Can you see it? Okay, that's a simple picture here. Now you can work through all the different verses in the 12 tribes, but God wants you to see this <laughs> because there is no judgment. There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, amen? Amen. Okay, so we see that. This is true Israel. This is spiritual Israel. Uh, Jew and Gentile Christians, those who have accepted Christ, come together. It's 12 times 12 times 1,000. It's the fullness. You can't measure them. You can't just count them. God wants us to see it. It's 144,000. No, not literally. It's innumerable. And it's not just natural Jews. It's spirit. It's Jews who have become born again through the blood of Christ and filled with the Spirit of God. And it's Jew and Gentile together. God wants all of the redeemed, ideal, complete, perfect, spiritual Israel, Jew and Gentile together. Because you see, the Bible reveals that it's not natural flesh that inherits the kingdom of God. But there is a natural Israel and there is a spiritual Israel. Uh, if you go to Galatians, the very end of the book, Galatians 6, verse 16, it says, The true Israel of God are those who receive Christ, and they actually walk in that revelation. God took Abraham out one day, and he wanted to show him the promise. And so he revealed to him the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. And he says, Your children will be as innumerable as those two. 
Now, which would you prefer, sand of the sea or the stars of heaven? <laughs> sand of the sea is a picture of natural. Stars of heaven is a picture of the spiritual. And so there's two pictures here, two ways of describing people, but they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What he's picturing here is spiritual Israel. And they are standing, verse 9. Everybody say standing. <laughs> yeah. Who can stand? That's the question. Well, right here we see it's those who are in covenant relationship with God. They're pictured. God knows the full number. And they're standing. And what are they doing? They're crying out. And they're clothed with white robes. They're cleansed. And they've got palm branches in their hands. It's like Palm Sunday. They're crying out, salvation belongs to our God. Uh, salvation. In Greek, it's soteria. In Greek, it's Je or in Hebrew, it's Jehoshua. Anybody know what Jehoshua means? Jesus. <laughs> They're crying out Jesus. That's what his name means. God, our Savior. And this has become such a revelation. Salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders taking up the pictures of chapter 4 and 5. And they're going, Amen, blessing and glory and thanksgiving. I mean, they're just caught up in praising the Lamb and the Father. And then all of a sudden, one of the elders comes over to John. John is getting progressively more involved in the picture. And he says, who are these? Well, a lot of people are asking, who are these? <laughs> And John is asked, who are these in the white robes and where did they come from? He says, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't. He said to me, well, I want this, I want you to see this, that this is one body of Christ. You heard the number 144,000, you saw the multitude. It's not just people who are natural Jews. These are spiritual Jews, one body, Jew and Gentile together. Because Jewishness is not a matter of whether you keep the traditions and the law. Jewishness is being right relationship with your God by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> True Jew is one whose heart is circumcised, not his flesh. <laughs> right? That's what scripture says. He says, okay, I want to show you who these people are. Who they are? Well, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation. Let me see, there's a pattern here. Let's see if you can pick it up. Uh, they are a people of promise. They've come through trials and struggles. Uh, they've got it in them. It's the spirit within them that brings them through these things. Now, a lot of people are still waiting for the great tribulation to, to show up. Uh, the revelation is here that they've already come through. <laughs> God sees us by the promise. And he says, uh, you are going to make it. Turn to somebody and says, we'll make it. <laughs> we're going to make it by the grace of God because we're in, we're in covenant relationship. This is not a death that he's describing here. This is a birth. The trouble, the travailings that are going on are, are not causing something to die. They're causing something to give birth. Can you see that? You know, some people, you give them the same symptoms and they'll say, well, somebody's dying. No, 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 no. The mom, the woman the, is giving birth here. Yes, there's going through some definite, very difficult trials. <laughs> but something new is being born here. And that's what, he, that's what he's describing here. They're people of promise. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're people of purity. Promise, purity, and also of God's presence. Therefore, they're before the throne of God. They serve him night and day in the temple, and he's right in their midst. Okay? Promise, purity, presence. Anybody see a little bit of a similarity here? Letter P, okay? Promise, purity, presence. They're also, they shall neither hunger nor thirst anymore. They know God's provision. They're delivered from every care and trial. All their needs are met. Uh, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. In other words, they know God's protection, the extremities. Yeah, they happen, but they don't destroy the people of God. Isn't that good to know? Okay. Then, for the Lamb who is in their midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to fountains of living water living fountains of water jesus said anybody tired here well let them come to me anybody tired of dead religious forms come to me <laughs> out of you if you come to me out of you will flow rivers of living water in other words he's got purpose in your life and then he says 
for God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And they're people of God's peace, promise, purity, presence, provision, protection, purpose, and peace. It's not just a matter of we can't lose. I mean, we're winners. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> there's a fullness in us. It says in John, when he was talking about the rivers of living water, it says, this he spoke about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Now, the Holy Spirit couldn't come until Jesus Christ had died and he brought in the covenant and he descended to the throne and then he poured out the Holy Spirit. But God wants us to know how much we have, how much we are, and how much we have. And we are just filled with the promise of God. Amen? Yeah, the Holy Spirit's not just promised. He's here now. So he wants us to see that. Now, the early Christians began to see that. Although they were in Jerusalem... They believed the word of God, and when they saw Jerusalem encompassed with armies, then they said, oh, this is Jesus' prophecy. What should we do? Matthew 24 says, flee. <laughs> Get out of there, because the city is under judgment. And that's exactly what the church did. They fled to a place uh, across Jordan, Bella in, uh, uh, Pella in Jordan, uh, not much in the city there these days, but over 50,000 believers when the door opened, when the Roman army withdrew, there was a time in the season and they got out. Some people say it was a literal 144,000. I don't know that. Uh, but symbolically, 144,000, the great multitude speaks of all the redeemed. Not one lamb perished. <laughs> Not one lamb perished. Now it also looks beyond that to all time. This is the entire victorious church. Do you know you're victorious? You know, it's Jew and Gentile together. It's not a matter of, oh, well, I'm Jewish or I'm not Jewish. No, there's no Jew nor Gentile in Christ. There's no male nor female. There's no servant or ruler in Christ anymore. This is the army of God. And uh, it was prophesied. You can look it up in Isaiah 49. It's, it's the very thing that John now shows us fulfilled is what Isaiah prophesied 700 years before. That's the first vision. Can you see it? 144,000 of the redeemed. It's the church of the living God. You don't have to try to figure out if you just make it. <laughs> it's when you see Christ and you're, you're sealed with the Spirit of God and you're sealed with His life and He wants to release it through us. I want to be more of that. Amen? Yeah? So the second one, we go to chapter... Uh, we go through the seventh seal and then the trumpets are starting to be outpoured. And when you know it, in between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, all of a sudden again, in the midst of all this destruction, there is this interlude, there's this, this time. And chapter 10 comes along and, and uh, it says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He's pulled with a cloud. He's got a rainbow on his head. He was like the sun, his face and his feet like a pillar of fire. He had an open book, little book in his hand and one foot bridged from the sea and the other one to the land. Well, we went through this almost the second week of the class. And I used it as an example of God using signs and symbols to, purvey, uh, to, to portray a very simple message. The angel is Jesus. The open book is the covenant. What Daniel said was, was told to seal. Now Jesus has opened it. It's the new covenant. The sea is the Gentiles, the land, the earth, is the Jews. He's brought both together. He says, it's time, it's finished. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Reach out and take it. <laughs> so it's a very pic same picture of the same vision. Why does he have to keep on repeating it? Because we don't accept it. <laughs> we don't see it. We're very blind sometimes. We go back to old covenant religious forms and God is saying, no, the new covenant is open now. Don't fall under judgment and condemnation. You're to walk in the conviction, but the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the life that, that Jesus purchased on the cross. And when he said it's finished, it's done. It's, done. it's finished, okay? So that's the whole picture here. What Daniel was prophesying 600 years before is now fulfilled. Jesus has come with the new covenant. The last verse of chapter 10 says, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now this is a continuing theme throughout Revelation. It starts off about tribes. 
And tribes always refer the 12 tribes of Israel, natural Israel. But here the order is, as it was always God's heart, to go not just to one person in one nation, but to reach all nations. Now he's saying that is the picture of the new covenant. It's for all nations. Those 144,000, those ones that were standing around the throne with palm branches, that's a picture of the, the, the feast of, uh, of uh, tabernacles. And tabernacles, the last feast of the Jews, was all about bringing in all of the nations of the world to, to share in this revelation. And so now he's saying, in Christ it's done. Okay? Third vision, chapter 11, the two witnesses. Oh, I know everybody right away. Two witnesses. Oh, who are the two witnesses? Well, I believe it's a lot simpler than we make it out to be. The enemy complicates things. And it gets really kind of ridiculous sometimes, you know. Some people are saying, well, you know, when the two witnesses, when that happens, are they two people? Uh, are they like Moses and Elijah? Or it sounds to me like Moses and Elijah are coming back. We have to see them again. Fire is going to fall out of heaven. The waters are going to turn to blood and all this. And uh, some people kind of get off on this with their prophetic gift. Uh, I remember one time it was a little church in Vancouver, and we had some pretty strange people come in sometimes. And at one time I was greeting on the door with this one guy, and, uh, and this guy came in and, uh, oh, how are you? Who are you? Uh, oh, I'm one of the two witnesses, he said. <laughs> and I kind of go, hmm, I was young in the faith, like what's going on here? The guy who I was with greeting, he didn't skip a beat. He said, oh, glad to meet you, I'm the other one. <laughs> I mean, that's what needs to get uh, to unmask and expose some of this uh, really egotistic, prophetical stuff that is nothing but false prophecy that's out there. It's just meant, it's fear based. It's, it's meant to scare people. This is not a scary thing. Chapter 11, another, the third vision that I want to share here tonight is all about two witnesses. Now, what do we see here? I was given a reed like a measuring rod. He's getting more involved. He's right in the vision now. They give him a reed. And this reed is actually to measure things, whether they fall short or whether they're going to fulfill that. Okay, there's a measuring stick here. And uh, just like it could be either for uh, mercy or judgment, it could be for deliverance or it could be for uh, destruction. Things are measured. Sometimes things don't measure up, so tear that down and rebuild it. Or, no, that's right plumb. That's going to stand. That's on a good foundation. Now, what does he see here? He says, well, rise and measure three things. The temple, the altar, and those who worship there. The worshipers. Uh, the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. This is one of the best internal evidences that the book was written before 70 AD because it says measure the temple. You couldn't measure something if it still wasn't there. Okay? So it's there. He says measure it. It's not going to measure up. <laughs> it's being measured for destruction. The Old Testament sacrificial system is being measured here. One of the last things that Jesus did when he came into Jerusalem, he went in and he cleansed the temple. And he said, you're not measuring up. You have made my father's house a prayer for all nations. You've made it into a den of thieves. Now he cleansed it, but they didn't respond. And so the state of that one is at the last is worse than at the first. Got filled with demonic influence. After that, they even crucified the Lord of glory. After that, after the, the veil of the temple was torn in two, they sewed it up again and carried on with their sacrifices for another 40 years. Couldn't receive the blood of the lamb, the best that God had, but they carried on with their own religious system. Now, Jesus is saying here, measure it. It's not going to measure up. John, you're right involved with it. Uh, there's three numbers that come through here about time. 42 months, verse 2. 1,260 days, verse 3. And three and a half days, or three and a half years, in verse 9. Now, they all happen to be 42 months is how many years? Three and a half years. And it is, if you measure it in Jewish time, of 30 days per month. It's 42 months, 1260 days. 
So he's talking about a period, three and a half. What's three and a half? Is it a literal number? I don't think so. Three and a half is a half of seven. <laughs> seven is God's fullness. In other words, it's something that is broken in the midst of God's full time in bringing something into being. It's a limited time of affliction, persecution for the, the people of God. When the wicked seem to triumph, but at the same time, God is bringing forth his true witness. In other words, in the midst of the persecution, you're coming in the midst of the trial and the tribulation. Never lose sight of the focus that we're coming through. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, you're coming through. <laughs> we need that encouragement. Not just so it sounds good. No, we, you need to be encouraged with the truth. Amen? Yes. Amen. Okay, so who are these two martyrs? Well, we get a clue very clearly in verse 4. There are two olive trees and two lampstands, two prophetic voices. Now, uh, if you're a Jew, you know your scriptures <laughs> here. Uh, not only could you have recognized Daniel and Ezekiel when John is quoting them and saying it's fulfilled, but here you'd recognize Zechariah. And Zechariah in chapter 4 has a picture of an olive stand and, or a, a lamp stand with two olive trees that are pouring its oil into it. And uh, miraculously, it's the oil that keeps on burning. It never stops. And God gave Zechariah this word when the temple back here, 550 years before Christ, was being rebuilt, rebuilt after they came back from Babylon. And Zerubbabel, who was rebuilding it, and Joshua, who was rebuilding the temple and the city, they needed encouragement. So Zechariah begins to prophesy, and he says, don't worry, Zerubbabel, what you started, you're going to finish. Okay? Now John picks up on this picture, and... Um, well, there's a lot of people that have said the two lampstands, the two olive trees, the two witnesses. Who are they? Are they Moses and Elijah? Are they the law and the prophets? Uh, which two men never died? Enoch and Elijah. <laughs> Do we have to wait for them to come back? No, the book of Revelation is very simple. Now, we've already been here in chapter 1. Scripture interprets Scripture. In fact, he even tells us in chapter 1, what is a lampstand? Lampstand? Chapter 1, verse 20, is his church. <laughs> the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here we have two lampstands. We have a lampstand. This is his church. We got two lampstands. Zechariah only saw one, but here we have two. And two olive trees that are pouring in the oil. The seal of the Holy Spirit is what God has begun is going to be completed. We've got the true church again, Jew and Gentile coming together in one the gentile church the jewish church but they don't see jesus broke down the middle wall of partition he sees them as one but he's trying to get the picture through to us so that we see what god sees now one of the parts of zechariah chapter 4 is not by might not by power but by my spirit says the lord you can't do this on your own your religion can never cut it you need the seal of the living god which is the holy spirit living breathing through us uh, imparting his life and and releasing his life through us uh, it, we don't have to deal with judgment and destruction so much that that can be a distraction god dealt with the negatives in our we're a whole new creature in christ amen now he's got a plan he's got a destiny he's got a purpose and what he's brought you through up until this point, have you been teachable? Can you learn <laughs> who you are and what God has for you? Now he's saying here, I want you to witness. Now the word witness here is martyr. <laughs> and they lay down their lives. But God, in the midst of it, he is bringing down a whole Old Testament religious system, but he's bringing forth a church that does measure up. <laughs> it's a church that is not under the judgment, but it's lined up with the plumb line of God. It'll stand firm on his foundation. And verse 7, they finish their testimony, and the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit. And everybody goes, whoa, oh, wow, the beast, the beast, the beast. You know, right away, we get distracted, though, by the beast. We get distracted by the judgments that are falling on the religious system. And God says, don't get distracted on that. Get refocused on the Lamb. Okay? Get refocused on who you are in Christ. Okay? Now he says that he's going to make war against them, the body of Christ, overcome them and kill them. 
Do you know that believers are dying for their faith throughout the earth right now, but the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? <laughs> the blood always springs up with new life. That's what brought the Roman Empire down. They thought they could kill Christians. The more killed Christians they killed, the more Christians were born again in the stands. We can't lose. <laughs> so we might as well win. Amen? Yeah. So he says their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Everybody goes, oh, where is that going to be? And wow, and the whole world will be watching. And that never could be until we got the technology now of television. and all. Really, that's not what he's saying. That great city, that is a, uh, that, that's a uh, which is called Sodom. Sodom, why? Egypt, why? Egypt is a type of bondage. Sodom is a type of gross immorality. And he says there's nothing so grossly immoral or, or so bondage-making as what took place where our Lord was also crucified. Uh, it's pretty clear by that phrase. Where was Jesus crucified? What city? Jerusalem. It's old Jerusalem. It's the old temple system of sacrifices that is being marked out here. He says, then from those peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, I'm in verse 9. Again, all of God's focus is on the peoples and the nations. Tribes is in there, but he's moved on from natural Israel. He's, he, he's, his vision is for the whole world. He says, those bodies, well, even though they won't be allowed to, be, to rest in the graves, and the whole world is rejoicing on them uh, over this, but after three and a half days, isn't that amazing? That's Pretty well the length of the time that Jesus' body was in the grave. <laughs> and he rose, and so he said, all those in Christ Jesus will also rise. Do you believe in the resurrection? Well, you better. Going up. <laughs> We're going up. Come on up here. That's a part of our faith. And then great fear fell, and there was all sorts of calamity and judgment that came against the old system. What he's basically saying is here, the two lampstands, Jew and Gentile, the church is unstoppable. Hello, <laughs> what God has begun, he's releasing in all the earth and it's going up to all the nations. I mean, look out China, look out Africa, look out Europe. It's happening and nobody can stop it. Isn't it good to be part of the greatest move that's ever going on right now? Wow, I mean, this, I get encouraged by this because God has moved on and the church's testimony is released to this. Um, He's moved on from the signs of the Old Testament. All the signs pointed to Jesus. Now the signs are to follow us. We're the church. Amen? Amen. Okay. He's moved on from just shadows and types to faith reality. He's moved on from one physical temple to a spiritual temple. Who's the spiritual temple? We are. <laughs> We're the body of Christ, right? So as God has moved on, we've got to move on with him. Uh, he's pulling the scaffolding down. The old temple was just a scaffolding in comparison to what God is really building. He says, don't put your hope on the scaffolding. It's coming down. God has his hope in a real building. It's called the people of God. He's gone from, he's moved on from one localized city, Jerusalem, to a universal community. He's moved from one national land, natural Israel, to all the nations of the earth. He's moved from one distinguishable race, it's not by blood, it's not by race, it is by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the grace of God. He's, cho he's moved on to a chosen generation. Do you know? That's you. That's us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so you got the picture? Okay, we'll move on to another one here. Chapter 12, fourth vision. It says great sign showed up. Three, three people, three characters. We got a woman, we got a dragon, and we got a male child. What is this all about? Is this all going to happen in the future? No. This is a picture, this is a vision of what took place when Jesus first came. The woman is the church. The dragon is the devil, Satan, the serpent. <laughs> Same one who showed up to Eve. Now he shows up to the woman who's giving birth. There's a good thing going on here. Life is coming to bear. And the devil wants to cut it off. He wants to stop it. But he says, right when that woman gave birth, 
The devil was there to cut it off and to catch it and kill it, just like Herod did with Jesus. But it says the, the, the man-child was caught up to God and his throne. Verse 5. Now, what we have here, not something that's going to happen in the future again. It's a picture of what happened in Jesus' first coming. His whole life was all about being dying for our sins, restoring us to God in the new covenant to the Father, and then being caught up to the throne. And from the throne, he not only rules and reigns, but he sends out his Holy Spirit. That couldn't have happened until Jesus did this. Can you see it? Well, when you see it, man, you can't, it's, it's not just an intellectual thing. This has got to grab hold of us. <laughs> it's got to be a revelation. Okay, now that's the first six verses of chapter 12. Basically, from chapter 11 to chapter 12 here, from the trumpets to we're going to go into the bowls, but just before here, there's another interlude. And this is right at the middle of the book, and it brings a change. It brings a change from the focus in heaven to right here, the nitty-gritty on earth. But it's all about victory. The first part from heaven is that Jesus has conquered. Now in the next part, the next 11 chapters, it's still that Jesus has conquered, but the devil is defeated. So the picture is Jesus up. The other side of that is devil down. <laughs> you know, I, there's some people trying to say Jesus is up, but they still got the devil up there too. No, no, the flip side of Jesus up is devil down. Okay, so you flip over the page, at least in my Bible, in the next six verses, it says, war broke out in heaven, and that great dragon was cast out. Michael and his angels, they fought, the devil and his angels thought, fought, but they could not prevail. In fact, four times he says, he was cast out. Who was cast out? The devil was cast out. <laughs> That's who was cast out. And uh, when? Well, some people are still waiting for him to be cast out. I call that unbelief if it's already happened. If the Bible says it's already happened and we're still waiting for him to be cast out, uh, then we're, we're operating in some kind of religious unbelief. It's time for us to move into faith. If God's moved into faith, it's time for us too. Amen? Amen? Okay? So chapter 12, man, tune in one day when we can go into it in depth. <laughs> but you go to uh, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God has come. And the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brother who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now if my Bible says has been cast down, past tense, I need to line up with that. <laughs> Instead of this, oh, won't it be nice one day when? No, no. It's good because already it has taken place. Amen? This should, be, this should be firing us up. This should be changing our vision. We are living below our calling. <laughs> now, if it means Jesus is up, and that means the devil is down, and where, where are we in the picture? Well, it says we are to have our feet on his head, <laughs> on the devil's head, just like Jesus did. Genesis 3 is fulfilled. Verse 15, the seed of woman and the seed of the serpent have already met, and though the seed of the serpent crushed the seed of woman's heels, his heel coming down crushed the seed of the serpent's head. It's done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, it's done. Well, if it's done, then we're well done. <laughs> it's time for our life to change. This is the central verse of the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10. Then the kingdom, salvation, power, and strength have come. Uh, God it's not just the natural central verse of this book. It's the spiritual heart of this book that we can see, you know, Jesus' first message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, reach out and take it. It's in effect. Strength has come. Uh, our strength is in the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Lord is our strength. His power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, he wants us to see it's not up there when you die high in the sky. It's right here, right on your plate. Right here, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. I'll tell you, when the church sees this, things change. And that's exactly what he wants us to see here. He says here in verse 12, they, or verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives to the death. It wasn't about me, it's all about him. <laughs> It's all about him. And a witness is prepared to lay down their life. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, 
you who dwell in him. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Yes, he had a short time. Get this context of it. It's not in the future sometime. It's referring. He was very upset that Jesus slipped from his fingers. <laughs> He thought he had him in the grave. He thought he had God in the box. But wouldn't you know, he tried to put God in the box, he breaks out every time. Now it was more dangerous than it had ever been. And now it wasn't just one Jesus. There was thousands of Christians around filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, and he couldn't put the fire out. The more you stomp on the fire, the more the embers fly all over. <laughs> it goes throughout the whole earth. So, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. If any of you are going through persecution, don't be discouraged. It's a good sign. Mm -hmm. If somebody is persecuting you, the devil is at the heart of it because there's something worthwhile in you persecuting. <laughs> if he's just leaving you alone, be concerned. <laughs> Maybe there's not, not something in you that's worth persecuting. But here, this woman is being persecuted. That's proof that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's proof that the devil is, a, he's defeated. So he goes after her, but when you know, God sends like two wings of a great eagle and just takes her out of that situation. I, I believe this is a picture of how he had set him up, the church to be in Jerusalem that was marked for judgment and destruction. But God just took them out into the wilderness. And again, not only were Satan's plans foiled against Jesus, but now against his church. He gets angry and he says, man, I only got a short time. <laughs> he knows that. And people who have short times make mistakes. Or if they're led by the Spirit, as much time, we make the most of it. All right? So then in chapter 13, well, now at the end of verse 17, it says, uh, the church fled Jerusalem. They came out, but... The earth swallowed up what was intended for the church, this big deluge. See, uh, Jesus said he'd never destroy the earth again by water. <laughs> the church knows this. <laughs> so we're free from that. But the earth here, which is Judea, drank it in. Over a million people died in Jer the destruction of Jerusalem at that time. The church escaped. Not one believer died there. But then the devil just got all the more upset. He said, well, I... These people got away. Then it says he went off to, uh, he was enraged, and he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. The focus here church changes from the Jewish believers to the Roman believers. And then in chapter 13, we see this actually come to pass. He stood, then he stood, who? The devil, the dragon, stood on the sand of the sea. Sand is not a very good place to stand. <laughs> you cannot stand on sand. <laughs> Sinking sand. Houses do not stand on sand. They've got to be built on the rock. He sees basically two beasts rise up. Two beasts rising up, one out of the sea and one out of the earth. One out of the sea, which is typical of the Gentiles, out of the earth, which is a type of Judea, of the Jews. The one out of the Gentiles is a political system. The one out of the earth is a religious system. I see two beasts, he said. Job saw two beasts. He saw Leviathan and Behemoth. God showed them to him. He says, you can't touch these ones, not in your own. But he says, I'll tackle them. You can't tame them, but you can. But I can. One was a land beast, one was a sea beast. Okay? There's always a parody. There's always a mimicking. The enemy is always to try to come closest to God without, well, he can't be it. Amen? Okay. So we got these two beasts. One, a Roman political beast. A beast is typical of a kingdom. All right? Daniel said that. And a land beast, which is typical of the Jewish religious system. Okay? This first beast, he comes out of the sea. He's got seven head, ten horns. And he looks just like the devil. You know, he's just right in league with him. He's got crowns on his blasphemous names, though. And this is this political system. That he's blaspheming God. He's insulting God. He's all the while trying to make himself to be something that he isn't. Seven heads, ten horns. He's making like he's got it all together. <laughs> but he doesn't. Uh, this is any anti-Christian government, a political system. 
It's antichrist. You cannot have antichrist until Jesus Christ has come. But don't lose your focus on Jesus Christ by putting your eyes on antichrist. Now, antichrist isn't mentioned here. Okay? This is not the antichrist. This is a force that is antichrist. Okay? It's released into the earth. It's a composite of all the beasts that Daniel and the prophets Hosea thought. And he says, well, who is able to, uh, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war like the beast? He's given mouths saying great things. Uh, uh, he can war against the, stay, uh, against the saints. Uh, it, the, it all looks so big. The Roman Empire looks so big. But the, the prophecy was very clear that it's coming down. Jesus' church was going to bring down the biggest empire that had ever been done up until that time. And it's a certainty. I can't go into all the details here. You go ahead and you read it. But in verse 9, it says, there's something very important here. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. In other words, use your ears. Because God is going to say something very important. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. The Obamas of our world will always meet their end. The Hitlers, the Stalins, whoever they are, if that's what you're trusting to, that's what will bring you down. <laughs> but if you're trusting to the living God, the sword of the Word of God, He'll always bear us up. Amen? Amen. Now, he, he highlights this and He says, Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, Hebrews says that faith and patience inherit the promises. John turns it around. Patience is always connected with time. How many know it always takes longer than what we think? <laughs> and so he's highlighting here, patience and faith inherit the promises. So don't give up. It's going to work out to the glory of God. And God is bringing you through to an even greater glory. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose the distraction of that. That is what you were standing and walking in. It's by the grace of God. He's done it. He's done it. You're in a covenant walk with Him, and He's bringing you through. Amen? Amen. Turn to somebody again and say, He's bringing us through. Come on. <laughs> this, is, this is so good, we need to share it with the body. Then He says, verse 11, I saw another beast, and he's got two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. This is a false prophet. He even calls him a false prophet in the next couple of verses. We're going to look at that, okay? But this is the false prophet, and he's, he's actually, this is the religious system, and it comes alongside and it says, political system, religious system, we got to work together. And that's what the Jews did with the Romans. They hated the Romans, but to get rid of Jesus, they said, come on, Pilate, do what we want you to do. <laughs> and for that brief time, they worked together. What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Oh, well, I washed my hands, but go ahead and do it. He was crucified. They got their way. And they didn't know everything that they got. There was a, a great uh, uh, a deception that came on the land. And for 40 years, they kind of coexisted until the last three and a half years before 70 AD. Finally, the whole lid came off and the Jews... And the, and the Romans just began this terrible war. You read it in Josephus, it, the likes of which in the, in the siege of Jerusalem, the destruction of the city and the temple really hasn't taken place before or since. Somebody says, oh, the world, world wars have been a lot worse. No, God says what took place wasn't just natural, it was spiritual. And these two systems brought one another down because they were against Jesus Christ. And he says it was granted to this second beast to give a breath to the image of the beast. And this image of the beast, and that's what everybody turns to, unfortunately, in chapter 13, the first part, and they try to figure out the image of the beast, which is the mark of the beast. Well, we already know what the mark of the seal of the living God is. It's the cross. <laughs> He gives that in chapter 7. But so many Christians, when they approach the book of Revelation, they go, first of all, to chapter 13 to try to figure out the mark of the beast, to figure out how to live, to stay away from the mark. That's backwards. Somebody says, well, just tell me who the mark of the beast is or what the mark of the beast is and who the Antichrist is. You won't even find the word Antichrist in the book of Revelation. That's how distracted we get. That's why we don't stand. And God says, I want you to have a revelation of who I am. And everybody's saying, 
tell me who the mark of the beast is <laughs> next week. <laughs> next week. You go find out for yourself. But I want you to read verse 1 of chapter 14. This is what God wants you to see. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. I would much sooner see what God sees, and that's the focus on the lamb, than trying to figure out a mark of the beast when he says, I've got the seal of the living God. Amen? Amen. Amen.